Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the missionaries of charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Haggerty. Thank you, Chris. I'm glad to be back. It is good to be with you, to be able to discuss St. John of the Cross, a saint who touched so many lives And when I first saw the title for chapter 15, The Suffering for Love of a Crucified Beloved, I couldn't help but think of St. Therese of Lisieux and that suffering for love was something that she kind of embodied, especially the last year or so. And she really was a great spiritual daughter of St. John of the Cross, wasn't she? Yes, she certainly was. And she learned from and this question, too, of you know not just suffering for love, but dying for love, dying out of love. Um, this is a great quote of St. Therese of Lisieux. Uh, you may know, Chris, and your listeners would like to know that in the last six months or so of her life, her own sisters, her blood sisters, and she had three other sisters in that Carmel, and they started to write down words that she was saying, sometimes, you know, just casually flowing out of her as she was suffering terribly from the tuberculosis in that last period. And it was recorded by her own sister, Celine, that at four o'clock in the morning, she died later in that morning, she said these words translated into English, one is committed to love only to the extent one is committed to suffering. And it's a striking statement, again, as a translation, but committed doesn't mean that we ask for suffering or we look for it, or we, in some manner, elevate it as a, some kind of prize in our lives. But to be committed, like a marriage commitment or the priesthood as a commitment for life, and that we don't turn back when we're invited by God into a greater taste of this. Because the reality is, and these saints would tell us from heaven, that was the path into a deeper, mysterious knowledge of Jesus Christ crucified. And they came to know him in his passion, and they came to know love, therefore, that much more, as they allowed their lives to be embraced in some manner by interior and exterior sufferings. Now, that's the, I think, a real key you bring forward in that in suffering, no one's exempt. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor or somewhere in between. The fact is, in the human condition, we suffer and pain is pain. It may seem as though there are those who are enduring incredible trials. But again, and I'm just using the example of the rich, even the rich do in a certain way, it's in how they either enter into it or they run from it. And I think that's true no matter who you are, don't you think? Yeah, it's true that everyone will suffer. And at the same time, the comment could be made that people suffer in very different ways because if you don't have God in your life or it's very minor in one's life, you know, the suffering of um, anxieties, of almost neurotic suffering of turning on self, being self-absorbed. People who put all their stakes into the things of this world, they end up suffering, a terrible suffering sometimes, especially as they, as life goes on and either there are losses or 
the disappointments and having chased after ephemeral things, things that do not last. So that kind of suffering is one thing, and but the suffering that God invites a person to see in wisdom as part of his plan for a soul, for the, a person, that can be in a way assimilated, that can be taken into our soul in a very profound way and lead to great things. I always find, because I've been around you know, the suffering of the poor, and I've seen this in the third world countries where terrible suffering Missionaries of Charity House in Addis Ababa, where I lived for four years, they had their biggest house in the world there. In my time, they were averaging 800 patients in their compound and all kinds of suffering of disease. What was really heartbreaking at times to see the suffering of the children, poor families, sometimes injured. I saw a few times youngsters who had climbed trees to get something out of a tree and got partially electrocuted. So some that child would die from that, and the, another in the tree would have a, a limb you know, burnt off, or you know, terrible things like that, cancer with those children. And then you wonder, what is God doing in this? There's a big question. And I think we have to also face this, that God invites sometimes, or he embraces these poor lives with his own suffering as also a source of grace for the world. Without their knowing it, many, many of the poorest of the poor are united to our Lord in his passion for a kind of continuation of Jesus' passion on the cross through the humanity of the present time. And without knowing it, they are part of the redemption of the world. So suffering has great mysteries to it. There's an apostolic exhortation of Pope St. John Paul II entitled precisely The Mystery of Suffering. And John of the Cross, you know, certainly has, it's not filling every page, but it definitely carved deeply into his own soul. And he understood it as inseparable from the deeper growth in prayer and relationship with God. Well, it's a very important point that he brings forward in all of his writings, teachings, that need to detach, and detach especially from the self. And as you're describing, that's in a very real way, that's in suffering. It's that giving over in the suffering, over that and connecting it with the great love of Christ, isn't it? Yeah, as you just said, Chris, detachment from self. Because any type of suffering could be, of course, physical things. If we are suffering, especially as we get older, people have cancer, but how you relate to that, whether it encloses a person in themselves, I mean, pain is pain. It's inescapable if a person is suffering painfully or in spirit. If their uh, effect of life, of emotion is in great grief or depressions of some kind, the great suffering of that is inescapable in one's own, own awareness. But the effort to be detached from self, and how to do that? Well, the pain doesn't go away, but a person is capable of a spirit of offering. We're capable of making acts of willed offering to God. You know, to say a, a small, very perhaps deep prayer, Lord, I offer this in union with your passion for the sake of souls. For those who may be dying on this day in need of grace, that souls not be lost today, that my suffering be united to yours on the cross, to Mary's suffering of her heart at the crucifixion, for the good of souls to be saved today. So this kind of detachment from self, that's an aspect of love. John of the Cross will say, and then, you know, great aphorism, Love is not to feel great things, but to be detached and to suffer for the sake of the beloved. Not to feel great things, but to be detached from self and to suffer for the beloved, to understand more deeply, you know, our meaning in, in suffering. Yeah, I think that's so powerful because 
that detachment from self in a very real way, the things we have clothed the self with in a very visual way. I mean, those things of sin, those things that we cling to, to try to cover up and to create an image of ourselves that we will try to find acceptable, but it, it just doesn't work. I think sometimes of those who begin the aging process, we're getting older, and so we begin to do things and act certain ways, and whether it's makeup or we begin to cosmetically, through medical procedures, try to alter our looks. But the fact is you're getting older, but you keep trying and trying to rail and fight. And sometimes you just have to, and it doesn't work because to the world it's very transparent that this cosmetic thing is clinging to you. So detaching from that and just embracing where you're at that's quite a freedom, isn't it? Well, that's a good illustration, Chris, of, you know, especially on our own time, you know, the kind of contemporary obsession to remain young, to hold on to the present moment. You know, behind that may be also the fearfulness of not just getting older, but the fearfulness of death. And a deeper spiritual life is, is always going to have that awareness of, this is all passing in this life. That it's not a continuation forever. And my sense of that too is, as a priest, strongly. You know, even at masses, I get a sense sometimes that there there are many people who really just live as though this is going to continue forever in this life. And clearly, as we hear that, what an, an illusion that is. And I remember my father, who lived to be ninety. My parents were not in good health in their last 10 years, so I saw them almost every weekend in that time when I was in New York. And I remember my father, who was sharp to the end in his mind, but he must have said eight or 10 times in the last couple of years of his life, he said, you know, how quickly all of this went. And then he would recount, you know, going to see a Brooklyn Dodgers game, you know, when he was for the first time when he was 10, or going into the Navy, you know, when he was 21, or the first day of high school or graduation, all of these things from the distant past, he said, it seems like yesterday. That awareness of the passing nature of things is also, that's true also of suffering. The difficult things that we are asked to bear and it's very unique in each life. Sometimes loss of what you love most and people you love most. But all of that has some deeper invitation from our Lord to live what the gospel said in one of the most essential statements of Jesus in the gospel. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, he doesn't mean death at the end of life simply. Unless it falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. It remains stuck, you know, where it was. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And that dying is meant to be in God's plan, the, the kind of dynamic purification that takes place as we not just bear stoically suffering, but that we suffer with love and offer in love that our eyes are taken off of ourself as best as possible and turn to an offering for others. And that's always possible. You know, a person in pain can make an act of offering for others. That is possible. And God must bless that, you know, abundantly when a person does that. We'll return to St. John of the Cross. Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. 
We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Throughout all of our conversations, it's been a quest to be able to comprehend, as it were, or to understand the best we can the contemplative graces that is a true gift that God is desiring to pour out onto us. And through the writings of John of the Cross, I think, as you've said here, you've helped us to see that The contemplative life, I'm quoting you now, the contemplative life is anything but passive. It demands an active generosity by means of which the soul deliberately stretches itself in self-giving, even beyond its human strength, so that grace may uphold it. Wow. I mean, that's, that's it, isn't it? Well, that the context of saying those words would be for us to remember, you know, what takes place in the interior light, including the hard purifications that are part of a perseverance in prayer. But this is meant, you know, even though there is a dissatisfaction experience in the desire to love and there are these trials of aridity or a certain darkness and obscurity that we have to live through in prayer. But when people are serious in prayer and grow in love in prayer, it does take you outside of prayer to a different compelling need to give. That beautiful rhythm that you see in saintly lives, but in people who are not saintly. I've seen it again and again in the lives of the missionaries of charity. A lot of prayer may be dissatisfying in the interior light, and yet the same people go off into a day with a great spirit of generous self-giving. And that's a necessity. We have to choose for that. And the one thing we have to be careful of, if we are suffering in our interior life, not to allow that to be a kind of excuse or a inclination to give up also in the outer realm of life. And the fact is they feed each other. If we're generous outside, the longing for God will be that much stronger inside the depth of prayer. So there's a rhythm to that and the need to to give, to be generous, to be sacrificial, you know, to turn attention toward the other, to have our eyes on the other. That's a key thing in, in spiritual life. And isn't that the great mystery of it all? The fact is that in this contemplative grace, that that would be the response as opposed even if there is, as we said over and over again, the feeling, even the many would term the consolation, may not have been evident to the person. It's just something that is occurring that we really don't have a specific control over, but only to the extent that we've 
just given that space for that encounter? Is that, am I being too esoteric? No, I think that's quite true. And just as a further comment on that, I mean, many people who take prayer, you know, seriously, if they begin to become, you know, desirous of God and begin to give themselves to prayer, and this is always the case in religious in congregations and the good congregations, but the one danger is that that could become, you know, we think that that's everything. And the fact is, contemplative graces, deeper prayer is always going to be accompanied by the gospel itself. Jesus demands in the whole of the life are going to be affected by a greater life of prayer. So the gospel itself, all of the various things of the Sermon on the Mount, all of Jesus' teaching, his request, his demand in love that we die to ourselves, that we deny ourselves for the sake of losing ourselves, that's all going to be carried to outside of prayer. And, you know, the, the greatness of becoming serious about prayer is it is bound, if it's authentic, to affect our life outside of prayer. And then, again, as we mentioned, you know, that becomes they mutually support, they affect each other then, the exterior and interior life. As Mother Teresa said one time, the interior becomes the power of the exterior. In a sense, the exterior life then confirms the authenticity of what we're doing in the interior life. And if we're giving ourselves to God in prayer, we're bound to come out with a compelling desire to give ourselves then in action also to others. Yeah, as you said, we want our Lord to know that he is much loved. And it happens that in those actions, it is an engagement. It, it is our loving, yes, the person in front of us or entering into particular situations where love is needed, that you're doing that as much for the sake of that person. But even more so out of your great love and response to the Lord. Am I hearing that correctly? Well, I like that phrase that we want our Lord to know that he is loved by ourselves. You know, I can't force another person to love him, but I want him to know. And there are, of course, ways to show that. And that's the whole point, too, of actions and love especially anything that we can do for poor people, for the lonely people, those who are thrown away in some way or have suffered in life, to show our Lord you are much loved by me by committed actions to others in this matter, not just you know, loving those that are easy to love. You know, John of the Cross is, you know, as much as he is a, you know, sometimes he will be called a difficult writer, you know, so challenging, but when it comes down to everything, his main theme is what happens if you are in love with God and you continue in love with God for a lifetime. He is a great commentator on the life of a love for God that one never lets go of and what happens in the progressive stages of this great love for God. Yeah, I was trying to explain this the other day, describing what we've been having conversations on. And the thing that I've come to the realization, and correct me if I'm wrong, Father Haggerty, but it's that realizing that when we are in love with God, that he's a God that is so immense, so beyond our comprehension, that the questing for it, you will never have the satisfaction of completely being able to meet that desire to give to him because it's just, it's too big in many ways. He's so big and that's okay. He's drawing us into that. And it's that drawing and that realization that I, it's not going to be enough, but I'm going to keep striving for it. That's where the challenge and the struggle and sometimes even the pain comes in. And it can't be described in the limits of even our feelings. Is that too much, do you think? No, that's, uh, again, very apropos and accurate in the context of this kind of teaching of St. John of the Cross and others you know, who would have taught us this. The saints, in one way, are teaching us God is so far beyond what we see. But the other side of that, you know, there's, a, there's two sides of that coin, you know, that 
One is that we have knowledge of that, we can be aware of it, and we can be more deeply aware of this over time, that he is this great mystery, so personal also. We have the gift of the Eucharist and his near proximity. He's giving himself to us in reception of communion. But the other thing that's happening here for all of these saints and the contemplative path itself is that the pain is that desire for God that intensifies over time. And that's what these people who have crossed that threshold into contemplative graces, that's what they experience. That the desire not only doesn't let up, it intensifies over time. It's like a person hungry who just gets more hungry over time. And as John of the Cross will say, if you gave a little few crumbs to a hungry man, you would only make his hunger increase. And this is in a sense, not that God is just throwing crumbs at us, but this is what's happening in the spiritual life, that the hunger, the desire for him, and precisely because sometimes he's showing himself, he does show himself providentially, he does give consoling experiences. He does do favors for other people after we have prayed for them. And he shows himself. And that, again, is like putting oil on the flame of a person's hunger and thirst for him. So it's not just that, you know, the apophatic knowledge that God is, you know, ultimate mystery, infinite mystery, but that the soul has real relations with this God of mystery and love. This God is very personal, who can be gazed at on a cross, looking at a crucifix sometimes happens, a mysterious means of contact with him. The result is the soul just enters another step forward in hunger and thirst and desire for God. It reminds me of, oddly enough, of something that Catherine de Hewick Doherty talked about once where the great baroness who founded the Madonna House, the great woman of prayer, servant of God, who would say that in helping the poor, if it is not done out of the love of Christ first, if it's not a response to the love of Christ, then it's just social work. It's patrimony. And the poor know that, and they will receive it, but it won't touch their hearts in love. It has to first flow from a love to respond to Christ. Then it becomes an act of love and a response. I thought that was really profound when she said it. I'm beginning to understand it better now through these teachings. What do you think? Well, that's certainly truth speaking there in Catherine Dougherty and you know Mother Teresa, you know, said the same thing. We have many saints who if they gave their lives to the poor would have you know expressed that and precisely because Jesus himself will tell us that in Matthew 25 when I was I was hungry you gave me food I was thirsty you gave me to drink I was sick you took care of me I was in prison you visited me I was a stranger and you welcomed me when did we do that when you did it to the least of my brothers you did it to me not for me to me Mother Teresa, you know, we used to say to her sisters, we are not social workers. You know, we are here to satiate the thirst of Jesus on the cross for love and for souls. And it's, you know, very true that deeper wisdom in these things comes from the life of prayer. It's not like a training of the mind then to accustom oneself to thinking in a different way, I think the prayer itself then begins to permeate the awareness in a different way. And there is a, a different sense of the sacredness of encounters with the poor. And that's one of the great, in a sense, paradoxical experiences. The poor, the St. Vincent de Paul spoke of this, you know, the poor can seem very rough and dirty and lives of misery, unattractive, very repugnant to our senses, and yet underneath that disguise, our Lord waits. Contemplative life of prayer 
it would seem naturally, although we have spoken in the tradition so often of contemplative life being in the monasteries and cloisters, locked away in that sense, but the contemplative life of mercy extended, the merciful corporal works of mercy to the poor, that's a great accompaniment to a contemplative life where our Lord is hiding, concealed in some manner in the interior life of greater depth in the soul, and then to realize he also hides outside a prayer, waiting for encounters with him in the lives of the poor. So, you know, I've written them about that in other books, but I think that's a very real thing. We'll, we'll become more sensitive to the presence of God in the poor if we're growing in prayer in a contemplative manner. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com And join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty.